When it comes to supporting longevity and healthy aging, a lot of people think about calorie restriction or some form of fasting. But in today's session, let's talk about exercise as a multimodal tool that can support your body's aging process and slow down cellular aging and enhance longevity. Now, I know we don't often think about exercise as a tool to support longevity because when people think of exercise, they think about mTOR, they think about protein, they think about recovery and insulin. And well, wait, doesn't that sort of conflict with aging and longevity? Longevity and what about cancer? What all of this? And so in today's session, what I would like to do is draw upon some scientific articles. And as we're talking, I'll share some images and all that in the show notes and also on the screen here on YouTube. And one of the papers that we're going to learn a lot from and distill a lot of the information that we're going to talk about today is titled The Effects of Exercise on Cellular and Tissue Aging. And what we're going to do is dive through all of the different mechanisms and talk about the nine hallmarks of aging. Now, this is just a great review if you're sort of interested in understanding some of the tangible mechanisms that are inducible and influenced by your diet, your nutrition, your sleep, your stress management habits, your exercise habits, and much more. So before we define and characterize these nine hallmarks of aging, I just want to offer this little preface. The only reason why we're talking about these jargonistic terms like genomic instability and epigenetic destabilization and cellular senescence is so that when we talk about the specific aspects of exercise, you can link the mechanism to exercise. So weightlifting, for example, guess what it does? It affects proteostasis. Proteostasis is one hallmark of aging. So I just want you to sort of make that connection. I'm not trying to lose you in the weeds of complexity when we get into this. So when we think about aerobic exercise, aerobic exercise really enhances mitochondrial biogenesis. Mitochondrial biogenesis helps prevent three or four of the nine hallmarks of aging, the genomic instability, the mitochondrial dysfunction, cellular senescence, and all of that. So just have a little grace, shall we say, when we talk about these nine hallmarks of aging. Now, I think this is good to hear this a few different times because this is something that maybe down the road we will have the ability to commercially assess these nine, a few of these nine hallmarks of aging so that we can see how we're aging biologically. So aging is divided into primary antagonistic and integrative hallmarks. In that umbrella are these hallmarks. You have, I think, four different hallmarks in the primary hallmarks um, that are modifiable. You have genomic instability, telomere attrition, and we're going to talk about all these in a moment. You have epigenetic alterations and you have loss of proteostasis. So let's just kind of quickly pause and define a few of these different terminologies, okay? Genomic instability is when your genes are able to be more susceptible to environmental damage. So that includes free radical stress, x-rays, ultraviolet radiation, and much more. So when your telomeres, which are essentially the ends of your chromosomes, start to age, they start to shrink uh, because of the telomerase activity has hit a uh, a nadir and it's slowing down. And by the way, exercise enhances telomerase. Telomerase is the enzyme that supports the maintenance of your telomeres. And these are the, the little kind of, if you think about your brand new shoes, those shoelaces, you know, those caps, those are essentially a, a very loose analogy and as to what telomeres are. Okay, so you have genomic instability that's paired with telomere attrition, and then you have epigenetic alteration. So as we age, our methylation patterns become imbalanced, and that contributes to dysfunctional uh, genes being turned on or turned off and genomic instability. So the, again, this is all clumped into, and, and lastly, this proteostasis, loss of control of, of, you know, you have excess or aberrant proteins, misfolded proteins in your cells. And all of this together causes, is it a primary way at which your, your cells age? And then as a response to that, you have mitochondrial damage, you have cellular senescence, and that's part of the second sort of bucket in the nine hallmarks of aging is the antagonistic bucket. And in, within this bucket, you have altered nutrient sensing. And so this can be IGF-1, mTOR imbalances. We've talked about this. AMPK, these are nutrient sensing uh, kinases or enzymes in your cells that are intended to respond to states of nutrient deprivation or states of nutrient excess. And those become sort of desensitized as we age. And by the way, when they become desensitized from overnutrition and all of that, we actually get loss of muscle tissue, which is another hallmark, a functional hallmark of aging. And then the last bucket, we have this integrative system, which is stem cell exhaustion and then altered intracellular communication. And so this, this would uh, lead to stem cell burnout. Uh, we see this in the skin. We see this in the cardiovascular system. We're going to learn about some uh, different uh, signaling molecules that are involved in 
in stem cell regeneration that are increased during exercise. So we're going to talk about that. Now, these are kind of hard to remember, but these are the nine hallmarks. And there's a few different papers that I will link that uh, talk about this a lot further. The challenge here is, okay, how do we measure this? So, so there's not really a lot of over-the-counter tests that you can measure to see, okay, well, are my nutrient-sensing receptors de desensitized? What about epigenetic or genomic instability? So one of the tools is the MyDNH test, and actually this looks at epigenetic changes. And so this is in that, in that first bucket that we talked about the pr amongst the primary hallmarks of aging, genomic instability, telomere attrition, and we talked about epigenetic alterations. Those epigenetic alterations can be assayed and measured with the MyDNH test. So definitely check that out. I found I'm actually two years older biologically than my chronologic age the last time I did that. So that was kind of interesting. You know, what do I attribute that to? You know, when I was younger, I over-exercised. So exercise is a J-shaped curve. So more is actually deleterious. More is not always better. So we need to kind of understand that. Now, hopefully I'm not losing you yet. And these images are keeping you sort of online with what we're talking about. But the way that I like to think about aging is the primary and secondary responses. So we have all these primary things that we talked about above. So these are all these, you know, challenges and epigenetic issues and mitochondrial issues and all of that. And then we have the functional decline in the tissue at the tissue level. And that's what scientists talk about. Again, these are two different ways to think about this, okay? I'm not throwing this all in here, but I'm just sharing with you the way in which this is described in this paper. I'm just making it really easy for you to hopefully tangibly take away some take-homes from this. If we think about secondary age-associated challenges, challenges, this would be loss of bone, loss of muscle, loss of cognitive capacity, uh, challenges within the heart, hypertension, uh, then, then we'd also have uh, cognitive and immune declines, fat gain, uh, ectopic fat deposition, and all of that, okay? So that's what we're going to really focus on because that is measurable. You can measure your liver enzymes to look at how much fat is being deposited in your liver. You can measure your heart rate variability. You can look at your, your do a CBC and white blood cell count and look at your white blood cells. So I know we've sort of gotten technical right out of the gate, but trust me, we're going to make this very, very practical henceforth. But I did just want to share that with you. And I think what we'll do in another whiteboard video uh, that will be more specific to YouTube is talk in more much more detail about those nine hallmarks of aging and ways to assess those practically. So we're going to get into that. But first, I do want to welcome our new listeners. My name is Mike Mutzel. I am grateful that you're here tuning into High Intensity Health Radio. If you're enjoying this content, what you can do to help us out. Again, if, if at the end of watching this video, you're like, wow, I got some practical information. This was helpful. You can leave a comment below. That actually really helps the algorithm here on YouTube. And you can just hit that like button. That Again, if you think this is helpful, that, that really helps us. If you're in iTunes and you're like, wow, this was good information. I like the show notes and everything. Everything, please leave us some feedback in iTunes. Now, I do want to let you know that your sleep is so important. Today, we're going to talk about muscle. We're going to talk about that you lose about 40% of your muscle mass over the course of your lifetime from your late teens to the time that you're 80, okay? Now, you can accelerate that, late, that rate of muscle loss if you're not getting good sleep, if you're not eating real food, if you're not exercising. So sleep is so important, friends. This is one of the things that we talk a lot about on this channel because it's one of the most important things that you do. Now, a lot of you are not sleeping well. You're getting up in the middle of the night. Your mind is racing when you're, when you're hitting the pillow. You're, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. So we formulated an amazing product over at Myoscience Nutrition to help you sleep, to fall asleep, and stay asleep. Plus, there's new supportive nutrients like potassium, like magnesium, like taurine that help to rebalance and support healthy hydration. And these uh, offer electrolytes. And there's added glycine. Glycine is really important for providing the raw materials to support the neurotransmitter GABA, which is great for calming uh, the mind and supporting a healthy relaxation response. There's L-theanine in there. There's GABA. Uh, it's a phenomenal uh, formulation and glycine as well as myo-inositol. So support your sleep by going over to myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience with an X.com. And please use the coupon code podcast to save on the updated and improved Myo Relax and Calm that's sweetened with monk fruit. Okay, so let's really dive into some of the specifics here because a lot of you were like, okay, well, I'm, I'm really interested in fasting as a tool to enhance longevity. But I also heard that exercise is good. So how do I sort of think through this and parse this out? And I, I get this question a lot. And this is something that I've you know, personally struggled with a lot because it's very easy to just fast, cut the calories and all that. The challenge there, though, is you accelerate muscle loss. Now, that is not a good thing uh, because obviously you naturally lose muscle as you age anyway. And muscle loss and bone loss and all of this, there's sort of this triad that we've talked about before 
osteosarcopenic obesity. And this is the connection between muscle loss, bone loss, and fat gain. This is a, a slippery slope that you do not want to go down. So in my opinion, you should consider intermittent fasting. You should consider periodic prolonged fasts, but you should always prioritize exercise. So that's the thesis of this video. You should always prioritize exercise and, and intermittent fast or fast to the point that exercise and sports and strength does not get compromised, okay? That is the thesis of this video because muscle is more important as you age than just the ability to go without food for an extended period of time, okay? That is the thesis of this video and I want to prove it to you as we go along. So let's first talk about, actually, let's talk about the heart first and we're going to get into muscle because the heart is, is relatively quick. So Aerobics and cardiovascular training uh, enhance endothelial progenitor cells. So your endothelial tissue is the functional unit of your entire cardiovascular system. It's like if you think about a, a, a brick church or statue or a brick building, okay? Yeah, it's a brick structure. It's a house. It's a church. It's a building. But the functional unit that comprises the in structural integrity of that is a brick, brick by brick by brick, right? And your cardiovascular system it's a bunch of little endothelial cells that are enclosed in a, in a circular system that have some smooth muscle to innervate them and move and push blood around and all of that. So when those endothelial cells become dysfunctional and dysregulated, guess what? You have cardiovascular dysfunction. Endothelial dysfunction leads to uh, ED erectile dysfunction as well. So people that have cardiovascular dysfunction can't get erections. This happens for both men and women. Okay. So Aerobic exercise training, exercise in general, which by the way, you need 150 minutes at least per week. Okay, so this is five days a week, 30 minutes of activity, plus two days a week of physical of resistance training. So that's if you're like, okay, well, how much do I exercise? Okay, that's the this is bare bones minimum. Okay, bare bones minimum, 150 minutes per week. Okay, so this is five days a week, 30 minutes a day. Uh, this can be spread out throughout the day. You can be 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there. Just get your heart rate up. Okay, or you know, if you want to look at a metabolic equivalent, a MET, this is between 500 and 1,000 METs. So sitting still, talking is one MET per minute, okay? The more that I move, the more that we mow the lawn. If uh, cleaning your windows, that's about three METs per minute. Uh, if I go out there and do sprints, that's probably going to be 50 to 100 METs per minute. Like, it's going to be a lot, right? You know, I'm not sprinting for a minute. It's like 30 seconds, 45 seconds. So just sort of think about that. But when you do that, you increase the endothelial progenitor cells, which slow the dysfunction linked, the age-associated dysfunction of your cardiovascular system. Okay, so muscle starts to decline, as we already talked about. Let's transition to muscle, skin, and bone. Really fascinating stuff. So between the age of, of about, you know, tw in your early 20s to 80, you lose 40% of your muscle tissue. Crazy. So if you're not exercising, guess what? You're, you're cranking down the rate at which that happens. So you have to provide that stimulation. That's where the minimum two days per week of resistance training comes in. Ideally, I'm biased. Four days per week is minimum. Uh, I mean, to get results, to look like you're getting progress. If you train two days a week, that's the minimum to be healthy. But with all due respect, no one's going to come up to you and be like, whoa, what are you doing? Like, give me your exercise program. They might be like, oh, well, at least you haven't gained weight like most people, which is better than nothing. But if you want to look like People come up to you and go, I want to know what you're doing. You got to train a uh, minimum four days per week. Now, the challenge here is frailty is linked with a host of different health issues. So you do not want to lose muscle tissue. This is where I think we got to reconsider exercise as the primary modality to optimize longevity. Uh, not that fasting, not that calorie restriction are inherently bad or terrible or anything like that. It's just like, hey, we also want to prioritize muscle tissue. So mechanistically, how does muscle loss work? What is really going on here under the hood? Now, I thought this was pretty interesting. Mechanically, muscle loss or sarcopenia is believed to be caused on the cellular level by loss of mitochondrial density and instability of mitochondrial DNA and free radical stressors. So here we go back with the nine hallmarks of aging. I know when I was talking about that, you were like, oh my God, where is this going? Why is this so complicated? Well, now we know mechanically and me mechanistically how inactivity and being sedentary leads to enhanced sarcopenic obesity and, and uh, osteosarcopenic obesity. Again, the loss of muscle tissue, bone, and gain of fat simultaneously. So we want to support our body's maintenance of muscle tissue and cellularly how that happens is by supporting the mitochondria because the mitochondria and the density therein help to send the different signals to prevent muscle loss. So this is why we, again, 
I want to repeat myself, but this is why exercise should be reconsidered as a longevity and uh, optimal aging, age enhancing tool. So regular exercise improves all of the above. But you know, when it comes to bone loss, uh, really important uh, information. Now, resistance training when it comes to bone helps prevent DNA damage and telomere attrition linked with uh, osteopenia and osteoporosis. So again, we're supporting uh, kind of that primary response there when it comes to the nine, one of the two of the nine hallmarks of aging in the bone. When it comes to the skin, there's a lot of information about the skin. Aged skin is depleted in mitochondria. So just by supporting mitochondrial health, and of course, fasting does support mitochondrial health, but uh, as does exercise. So mitochondrial depletion and accelerated aging of collagen is, is reported. It's been long known that the brain uh, is involved in uh, the, the brain dysfunction that is uh, is improved by exercise. This has been long known. And, and mechanistically, how does this work? Well, when you exercise, again, you support those endothelial progenitor cells. So we can just piggyback off what we know. You support mitochondrial health. But you also increase a level of this brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Many of you have heard about this. BDNF helps support neuronal genesis and the growth and maintenance of neurons within the brain. So that's really helpful. Now, when it comes to the eyes, this is something that many people, you know, if you go out to dinner with someone in their 50s, 60s, they're looking for their readers to read the menu, right? Your eyes change with age. Now, guess what? Exercise also supports the eyes by, by these same mechanisms with the mitochondria and with brain-derived neurotrophic factor increases. So being able to see is pretty darn important. Another factor associated with, with aging is changes in glucose control. So we've known that you become less tolerant to carbohydrates as you age. And that is an argument uh, for the ketogenic diet. You should you know, consider the ketogenic diet, especially as you get older, because your ability to handle and tolerate carbohydrates declines. And part of that, again, goes back to that those nine hallmarks of aging and those nutrient sensing receptors. Uh, they, they become a little bit less sensitive. So therefore, we probably shouldn't be having as much carbohydrates. You naturally become more insulin resistant as you age. And part of what exercise does is it improves whole body insulin sensitivity directly and indirectly, right? By just moving your muscles, what you're doing is you're sending different intracellular switches, cytokines. They're actually called myokines because they originate from your muscle tissue. So one of the things that we're going to get into in just a moment, but since we're here, I would like to talk about it. One of the things that naturally increases as we age is inflammation. It's actually characterized or called, ascribed, should we say, uh, inflammaging. So you naturally get more inflamed as you age, right? It kind of sucks. So how can you attenuate that? Well, exercise does that. And part of that is because you're periodically increasing what might be deemed a bad myokine, interleukin-6. You might be saying, IL-6, I've heard of that. That's pro-inflammatory. That's bad. Exercise must be bad. Nope. We cannot think about the world, particularly the body, in these binary terms because when you periodically, transiently uh, increase IL-6 from the muscle tissue, it sends a whole host of these various uh, signaling molecules that we're going to get into that specifically slow down aging. Now, chronic elevations in inter interleukin-6 in other tissues throughout the body are problematic, okay? Exercise has been shown to minimize or offset one of the first hallmarks of aging, which is genomic instability. So exercise minimizes this by, by decreasing free radical stress and eight OHDG, which is 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine. Uh, this is a marker of DNA damage. So you can actually measure this via urine and blood. Um, you can actually see your 8-OHDG. People that have high levels of heavy metals and persistent organic pollutants and poor free radical responses uh, have high levels of 8-OHDG. A company called Metametrics uh, uses this. And also uh, exercise reduces this, another switch involved in inflammation called NF-kappa B. Okay, so we talked about telomeres before. Again, we're going back to the primary hallmarks of aging. Telomeres and telomere attrition is one of the, that second hallmark of aging. And guess what? Exercise increases the enzyme called telomerase that helps repair uh, your, your telomeres. Um, exercise also affects DNA methylation and it preserves histone stability and all of that. Um, we've known for a long time when it comes to proteostasis, these misfolded proteins and all of this that are, that are affected by autophagy, you know, we used to think that the only way to enhance autophagy is guess what? Through exercise. Well, I mean, we used to think that the only way to enhance autophagy is through fasting, but guess what? Exercise also enhances autophagy as well. So we're going to discuss, um, a lot more about that. Okay. Here's where I think it gets really interesting when it comes to the nutrient sensing receptors, the AMPK, the IGF-1 and all of that, um, 
And this is where actually muscle loss occurs. So loss of muscle mass also occurs due to changes in protein balance that is exacerbated as we age and exercise helps regulate these pathways. So it has a tonic effect on IGF-1 and mTOR and the IGF-1 mTOR axis. And so overexpression of mTOR, overexpression of IGF-1, bad. But when you exercise, you are having, you're having a more pulsatile, a natural ebb and flow of these different nutrient sensing receptors and, M and so forth. Also, when it comes to the, the sort of a, the antithesis of, AM, of, of mTOR's AMPK, that is increased when we're exercising. So again, we're, we're stimulating all these different receptors, which is great. Okay, so let's talk about the mitochondria. The mitochondria, you know, and mitochondrial damage is just part of aging. It's a challenge uh, with that. And when you exercise, you're supporting your body's mitochondria. Uh, you're, you're supporting this through this enzyme called PGC1-alpha. And that's increased when you exercise, and that is stimulating your body's ability to regenerate your mitochondria, to build new mitochondria, and to increase the density. And so that's really important. You know, so athletes don't have the same age associated decline in the ability to combat these free radical stressors that inactive people do. Inactive people don't have the sort of armamentarium of free radical neutralizing enzymes to combat all the free radical stressors that increase naturally as we age. So exercise helps to give your body more ammo, so to speak, to combat these free radicals. Uh, exercise improves uh, mitochondrial biogenesis like we talked about. So there's a few figures here that I think you might like. And these are showing, again, the differences between the acute effects of exercise, that is, in, in the immediate uh, aftermath of exercise in the post-exercise window and what's different from chronic exercise. So that's important. So when we make this a habit, and that's what we want to do, friends, even if on days that you don't feel like it, you're like, do I really, I've eaten good today and I've fasted. Do I really have to exercise? Yes, that is the question. You do need to exercise. So this is where I think this is interesting because one of the hallmarks that we haven't really talked about is the cellular senescence. And these are cells that are sort of rusty. They're, they, they should be sort of cleaned off and they should undergo apoptosis and die, but they don't. And what's problematic about these senescent cells is they communicate with other healthy cells that aren't rusty and they cause them to be more problematic and bad. So cellular senescence is a problem. Now, exercise and people who regularly exercise have a lower prevalence of cellular of cellular, of senescent cells particularly within their immune system now this is really important with regards to the current public health pandemic that's going on is a lot of people are getting immunized and they're getting sick i'm not and i'm not saying that as an anti-vaccination message it's just it is it is what it is you're hearing about this from the cdc even we're, we're hearing people that uh, are going into the hospital and they're dying now, the death rates from this disease are actually quite low. You know, they're based upon age and all of this. But a lot of these people that have these other conditions, heart disease, you know, uh, obesity, fatty liver disease, insulin resistance, the reason why they're more susceptible, partly mechanistically that is, is because they have senescent cells uh, and they have age-associated immune dysregulation, partly due to immunosenescence. Now, What's interesting about that is we can make the immunization so much more powerful if we also told people, hey, in the months before you get a shot, you should start exercising. It would make the therapy so much more effective. But we haven't talked about that. And I, I, I question why we haven't made that part. You know, Why were we giving out free donuts instead of free gym passes and told people, hey, you can make the shots way more effective if you exercise because would we be experiencing this surge? Would we be experiencing... Uh, all of this. I'm, I'm not really sure, but it's something that we should be uh, talking about. So there's an interesting new uh, cellular switch uh, signal molecule called PI6INK4A. I know it's a big tongue twister, but this is a marker of cellular senescence and it's linked with chronologic age. Well, guess what? Whole blood analysis have shown that in uh, exercise individuals, this level is markedly lower. This level in the whole blood is lower compared to people who don't exercise. So really important stuff. Um, this P16. So you've heard of P P53. This is a tumor suppressor protein. Well, this is P16 uh, superscript INK4. This is linked with higher levels of inflammation. So again, exercise reduces this. And, and again, this is looking at more sort of the metabolome on a, on a on a deeper level. And maybe one day we'll be able to measure these. You know, looking at. Uh, proteomics and metabolomics and all that, but we don't yet have that available. I mean, there, there's some available, but they're pretty expensive. So again, exercise does all of this. It activates these plur pluripotent stem cells, overcoming stem cell exhaustion, which is another hallmark of aging. 
And last, but certainly not least, uh, we talked about insulin sensitivity and glucose homeostasis. Uh, exercise has been shown to, and the contracting of muscles improve glucose homeostasis. So I know this was a lot. I would like you to refer back to the video if you're listening in iTunes and check out the show notes because some of the images that are included in, by the way, this free paper that you can download and check out for free. If you're if you're a personal trainer or you're a health professional, you definitely wanted to check out this paper because it's a phenomenal read and it's very pertinent to what's going on right now because we've been talking about exercise as a preventative, you know, part of the, the sort of containment measures. There's a lot of people talking about exercise. So uh, hopefully after this video, you're like, man, okay, I understand fasting is helpful for all the stuff that you mentioned, but exercise is as much or more beneficial for all of that. So um, yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit that like button, leave us some feedback in iTunes. I'm grateful that you tuned all the way in. We will catch you in a future podcast down the road. Appreciate you guys. Yeah.